welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Tom Roach, and I'm joined by my guest today, Joseph Peet. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. We're here to discuss uh, Northwest Indiana and its unique identity in the uh, Chicago area. Uh, Joseph is an award-winning journalist who's published several uh, articles and books on Northwest Indiana. And uh, I thought maybe we might start off today by talking about what these towns in Northwest India, India have in common. We've got Hammond, Gary, Valparaiso, Michigan City. Um, what, what makes them uh, members of this community? Oh, absolutely. A lot of uh, Northwest Indiana spilled over from the um, heavy industry on the south side of Chicago. You had the steel mills on the southeast side and the slaughterhouses on um, the slaughterhouses and famously in the south side. And a lot of that, um, after it got built out, you know, a lot of the industry just spilled over the state line over to here. Hammond was initially founded as a state line slaughterhouse. It was uh, by an industrialist out of Detroit who pretty much lived his whole life in Detroit, used a lot of his proceeds that he made here to um, build Detroit's first skyscraper, the Hammond building across from City Hall, uh, used it to help fund the Detroit Institute of Arts. Um, you know, most of, the, uh, most of the Northwest Indiana started as company towns where you had, uh, you know, uh, U.S. Steel built Gary Works and the city of Gary was built around it. Um, East Chicago was built around the, um, the uh, uh, Mark Manufacturing Company and Inland Steel Mills. You had, uh, you had uh, the uh, Standard Oil, of course, was the kind of the reason why Whiting developed the yeah. refinery there. And what, what it kind of created was you have a very kind of blue collar working class identity yeah. that has, um, the, you, you know, the economy has been evolving. There's more um, modern jobs and industries now, but there's but been a Historically, yeah, if, if you can really see it. If you look at the, uh, at the lake, right? You look at Chicago and you've got uh, parks and, uh, you know, commercial buildings and things and houses if you go north and you come around uh, into Northwest Indiana and you've got industry everywhere, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, until you get to the dunes, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's one yeah. of the few places in the world where you can go to a beach and, um, or in Whiting, for instance, and see someone like surfing next to a massive oil refinery. Yeah. But par part of what the heavy industry did with Northwest Indiana too, was it created an incredibly diverse area for Indiana and the rest of the Midwest because you kept bringing in um, generations of immigrants to staff the mills, to uh, those kind of undesirable jobs that they had to you know, bring in people from uh, abroad. And that created kind of a definite uh, melting pot and a kind of a cultural hodgepodge. And you can still go all around the region and find like Eastern European delis and um, traditions like Punchki um, is celebrated at Fat Tuesday. And you just have a lot of like Eastern European influence in particular. And I, I, I use one of my books, 100 Things to Do in Northwest Indiana. It was, um, I, they just, an editor dissuaded me from using the word polish off like a hamburger because there were so many references to um, Polish culture in, such as Pierogi Fest and um, so on. It, it was such a predominant theme through the book. So um, it, th this starts then with um, um, sort of things spilling over from Chicago industry and things like that. I also know there was a, uh, a neighborhood uh, where there was a lot of gambling and stuff right, right over the border. Um, the Roby uh, district or something, right? Oh, yes, yes. Um, when Hammond was founded, there was a town of uh, Roby that was later annexed into the city. Yeah. And it was notorious for being, um, it attracted a lot of gamblers from Chicago especially. But it was, uh, they had boxing, they had prize fights, they had um, horse racing, it was kind of like a lawless area, and they were able to kind of keep, they, they had, the, all the local politicians were kind of in the pocket of the um, gambling interest there. They were said to be like robiized, and it got like so out of hand at one point that the, um, the, Indiana, the governor of Indiana ended up sending in the National Guard to kind of shut it down and restore law and order. And later it kind of became a racetrack where for years after that it was uh, kind of a training grounds for a lot of the drivers that went on to the Indianapolis 500. And that ended up shutting down as well because they had a number of accidents, some of them fatal. And when a tire came off one of the um, cars, it ended up uh, seriously injuring six of the spectators. And you know now it's kind of forgotten. It's where like the Walmart is right by the state line. It's, is any of this left? Is there any remnants oh, of that? There are, um, there are a few, you'll see a few tributes at Bulldog Brewery in downtown Whiting. They have like a Roby Red Ale as like a, um, uh, remembrance of it, but like a lot of it has just kind of been lost to history, which is really the book lost time and I was really trying to really capture some of the bygone institutions that like Phil Smith's and Goldblatt's and EC Minus and the amusement parks, the roller coasters and Ferris wheel at five points that really, um, you know, back in the areas. There was a big amusement park at Route 30 and 41, am I? Oh yes, uh, that's the, um, 
the Kitty Land, uh, Kitty Land in Cherville. That was uh, very well known and a big regional attraction. But you, you had a lot of that by the lakefront in Hammond for years and years, where it was uh, people would get off streetcars and they'd go to Madura's Dance Land and dance to big or, uh, big band music, and they would um, there were uh, you know German beer halls and. There was a, a significant amount of entertainment there that's kind of all faded and lost to the um, the ethers of history. Yeah, it was, this was during the uh, the Capone era, the gangster era in oh, Chicago. Oh, absolutely, during the early half of the 20th century. He had a, he ended up having an outsized influence on Hammond as well. Um, part of the, the Lost Hammond book, one of the things I detail is uh, Wolf Lake, kind of in Hammond, kind of had a reputation as a gangster's graveyard. It was where Leopold and Loeb from Hyde Park dumped uh, their body of their victim. Oh, really? They, they, yeah, absolutely. And they, um, Al Capone, the, he took um, two rival mob bosses down to, or two uh, rival mob captains or down to the plantation, which was a roadhouse in Hammond, and then they ended up uh, beating them with bats and murdering them, and they dumped the bodies at Wolf Lake. But it's long, it's kind of had a sordid history. Uh, Hammond also had one of the largest distilleries in the Midwest, the Hammond Distillery, and Al Capone was rumored to have had a role in it um, and to have kind of kept it secretly operating during Prohibition. Yeah. That's nothing that's been verified, but he's, uh, yeah. he kind of has cast a long shadow over the, yeah. over the region. Well, every, every town in the Chicago area, I think, has an Al Capone rumor, but uh, the, the ones about Hammond may be true, I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, one of the more interesting gangster things I discovered, too, was that um, Whitey Bulger, who's famous of being the head of the Boston mob, actually robbed one of his first banks in Hammond, and that's oh, really? how he first came to the attention of the FBI. Because um, they were, in, he was in Chicago with a friend, and they thought like, oh, Hammond was kind of like a sleepy place where they might be able to pull it off. But they went to rob the place, and they saw there was a police officer inside. So they kind of, um, you know, laid low. But they noticed another bank and came back there later. And then ro robbing it is en what, what robbing that bank in Hammond is what ended up leading him to become like an FBI informant. And uh, but I would never have guessed in a thousand years before uh, I wrote the ro researched and wrote the book that there was any sort yeah. of connection with uh, Whitey Bulger to Northwest Indiana. And John Dillinger too, right? Oh, uh, absolutely. Was uh, uh, jailed in uh, Crown Point and they still, uh, uh, I think the, I remember the, the, you could visit where he was held in a cell and stuff. Is that still a bit? Uh, yeah. Sadly, no. The, the John Dillinger Museum is currently mothballed. I do hope it comes back someday. It was in the Indiana Welcome Center in Hammond and then they moved it down to the Crown Point Courthouse. And it was a, it was a very um, interesting attraction. They had a lot of the, uh, memorabilia. Uh, it was. Uh, it, they had this. Oh, go ahead. is this the escape where he uh, he took a bar of soap and carved it to look like a gun? Oh, absolutely. To yes. get out. Yeah. Yeah. They. Um, yeah. He famously escaped um, from the Crown Point, uh, the courthouse in Crown Point, by yeah, um, and painting it with a shoe uh, shoe polish, if I recall, to make it look black. And then he, um, and it was filmed in that Johnny Depp uh, movie. My, one of my editors at the Times was actually an extra in that uh, yeah. when they filmed that a few years ago. But it was, uh, you, you still see some vestiges of that around too. Like the Porter County, um, Porter County Sheriff's Office has like one of his Tommy guns and they'll bring it out to different events like upon request. <laughs> I was at the, the, when they dedicated the Centier Bank Building in downtown yeah, Gary, yeah. I was covering that as a reporter and that was one, they were trying to do like a Prohibition 20s, Roaring Twenties yeah, era theme yeah. and they brought out the Tommy gun and uh, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, um, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about the good things about the area. Hammond obviously changed, Northwest Indiana changed over the years. Um, and uh, like you say, they cleaned up that Roby area, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, and what, you know, what's the dominant industry now in the area? What, uh, you know, what's driving the economy in these towns now? Uh, you do have a lot of, you still have a lot of heavy industry. Um, Indiana, mainly due to this one little corner of the state, has led the nation in steel production for something like 30 years. Um, you still have the it's large- Still now? Oh, yeah, still, yeah. No kidding. The, yeah. They, they only employ a fraction of the people they used to because of automation and everything. Yeah. But it's um, half of the integrated steel mill capacity in the entire country is uh, still clustered here. It just has a strategic advantage because it's on the Great Lakes. Sure. So it's very easy to get iron ore from Michigan and uh, the iron range in Minnesota down here. It's just cheap and it just has a geographic advantage in that regard. Um, but you still have, you have the largest inland oil refinery in the Midwest. You have, um, uh, you, you know, they make everything from uh, gummy bears to packaging boxes 
for Amazon and Home Depot to, there, there's still a significant amount of manufacturing here, but lately you've, you, you know, the economy has begun to modernize somewhat. Your healthcare is beginning to play a role as it has in many of the kind of legacy Rust Belt communities. And um, you're seeing, uh, you know, the economy's evolving and diversifying more, but it's, this is still an area where, you know, it makes car parts, it makes uh, steel for appliances, for bridges, for cars, for, um, you know, that's used on all, many appliances, NFL stadiums, the caps at Starbucks, uh, but the, you, manufacturing still plays an outsized role here. Yeah, that's interesting. And of course, there's also some amazing uh, architectural uh, houses and things along the lake. Uh, you know, almost like what you'd expect to see on the North Shore, except it's uh, it's around uh, north of Indiana, around uh, what um, around Michigan City and up in that area, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, Beverly Shores in Porter County. In a hundred things, one of the things I recommend is um, with the Indiana Dunes National Park. It's kind of a 60, nation's first sixty-first. National Park, it's a sprawling area. A lot of people just go directly to the beaches, but there's all kinds of dunes and trails. And one of the unique attractions is the Houses of Tomorrow in uh, Beverly Shores, where during the South Side, um, during the Columbia World's Fair in Chicago, yeah. they built these futuristic houses, including one that has a garage for a helicopter and another like looks straight out of the Florida style. Yeah. And they were basically for this World Expo, they were built and to highlight some of the most unique architecture at the time. And then they ended up shipping them by barge across Lake Michigan to this um, like beach town near the Indiana Dunes in uh, Porter County. And then they've been preserved by the National Park Service and um, Indiana Landmark. You can go out and see them anytime. They're very, uh, very visually striking and make for great photographs to put on Instagram or whatever. But it's, um, you can go and tour. They have a preservation tour that the, they do once a year to raise funds to maintain them. Yeah. But th there is a significant amount of um, unique architecture in Northwest Indiana. You have like the city, Meth some of its ruins, unfortunately, like modern American ruins, like the Methodist Church in uh, downtown Gary or Union Station. Yeah, I noticed that, that, uh, that church and some of the other buildings in, uh, in downtown Gary uh, are on a national photographers, a couple of national photographers' websites and people like, you know, take vacations to come to Gary so they can shoot in these, uh, these dilapidated old buildings. I, I think oh, that's absolutely. fascinating. And they've actually, I think Gary actually appointed somebody at one point to kind of oversee that, you know, it's kind of a, a, a tourism uh, host, yeah. Yeah, they have, it's one of the, it is one of the most popular spots for um, urban exploration, kind of shooting places like the Palace Theater that were very grand and opulent when they were built, but have fallen into disrepair. But you'll even have photographers come over from Europe where they'll hit, a, they'll do Detroit and um, Gary to shoot the, uh, to shoot the ruins there because it's like, th there's nothing almost comparable to it in America, where you have like a grand Gothic style nine story yeah. church that is, um, Gary has made some efforts to kind of capitalize off that. They did start doing an annual architecture tour where they take people around and show the different, show off yeah. the different buildings, both inhabited and um, dilapidated. There's and something to be said for, you know, studying the architecture of an abandoned building, because if you you want to look at a, in Chicago, right, they're all, they're all fixed up and there's glass in them and you don't have access, but you can actually walk around uh, in these buildings and some of, these, some of the structures left over from the old steel mills and you can see how they were made and uh, you know, touch things, pick them up. It's, uh, it's a very different experience, very hands-on, uh, visually interesting experience. Oh, yeah. absolutely. They're also looking at turning City Methodist Church into a ruins, European style, like ruins garden, like a lot of the old castles there, where they would, you know, take down some of the, uh, the, you know, more, more dangerous parts of the ceiling that might be collapsing and kind of, you know, shore it up structurally and then have it where it's like this outdoor space where you're preserving and celebrating the architectural heritage, but, but you know, um, uh, doing so kind of in a safe way. They're talking about putting an amphitheater there and doing, you know, possibly like Shakespeare in the Park, possibly yeah. concerts, like that type of thing. But there's been more of a push to try to save some of these uh, structures. Because you've seen where you've had, like one of the banks still in Jarabda, New Chicago, is a very opulent um, Art Deco style bank. And it got, uh, ended up being destroyed for Walgreens, which is subsequently closed. And it's, th yeah. there are many architectural treasures here in Northwest Indiana. And just hopefully there'll be more of an effort to preserve them. We've, we've lost a few, unfortunately, in the last year, even with yeah. um, the Gary Water Tower and the uh, uh, the Gary Memorial Auditorium where, you know, the Jackson Five first played. Uh, Harry Truman gave a speech there. Frank Sinatra um, famously played a concert there that ended up on the cover of Life magazine where he was uh, trying to encourage the local high schools to accept uh, desegregation. Um, there was a lot of history in that building and unfortunately it uh, came yeah. down.
You know, that was uh, one of the attractions in Paris a hundred years ago is the, is the dilapidated buildings. Uh, people would come and they'd walk through these old, uh, you know, churches and things that had fallen down. Um, and of course now they're all, everything's built up because it's all much more commercial than it used to be. But uh, it's not, not that odd that uh, Gary's capitalizing on that. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, let's let's talk about uh, the uh, the Christmas Story movie uh, and uh, what what that has done to sort of uh, uh, change the image of Hammond a little bit and how people feel about that as part of their identity here. It's a very um, very important part of the cultural heritage in Northwest Indiana. Gene Shepard was a um, Hammond native who went on to become a very popular radio personality in the East Coast. He had a like late night show in. Uh, in um, New York City that was on the air kind of in the early morning hours. He had a loyal following called like uh, the Night People and he did things like he got um, a fictional novel called I Libertine. He yeah. got it trending on the New York Times bestseller because he convinced so many of his callers to phone into bookstores to request this completely fictional yeah. non-existent book. Yeah. And he, um, you know, he was an author. He wrote for national publications and uh, but he ended up, um, his book, In God We Trust All Others Pay Cash where he wrote kind of nostalgically about his um, childhood growing up in the 30s and 40s in uh, Hammond. Um, it ended up being transformed into the holiday classic. So uh, let's go back Christmas to part. the book for a second. So uh, he, the reason he wrote that book is because he, he talked about Hammond frequently when he was on the air in New York, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. His childhood, he kind of pioneered the style where you would have the, um, it was later popularized in things like The Wonder Years, but where it was kind of like an adult looking back humor, narrating his own childhood in kind of a humorous, um, through a kind of sepia tinged lens. And that, that he, he, he entertained people all up and down the eastern seaboard yeah. from Philly to Jersey for years with like the tales of, uh, you know, here. Um, and you, you see some of us in the movie, like the Claude Hopper from Griffith, and there are plenty of Northwest Indiana references in the, uh, the Christmas Story movie about the father's you know, curses hanging over Lake Michigan, a tapestry of profanity hanging over Lake Michigan. And um, he wrote quite extensively, and he wrote, he talked on the radio and wrote quite extensively about Hammond. Some of those are in, um, covered in my book, but he, he has had a, you know, he, he resulted in that popular tourist attraction at the Indiana Welcome Center just by the state line where um, A Christmas Story Comes Home, where they have some of the window story displays that have been from the Macy's in New York City and kind of recreating the movie. And you can drive all around the region and see the famous leg lamp is in many windows and many part of many <laughs> Christmas decorations is kind of a tribute. Um, there's a community center named after him. They do an annual event in downtown Hammond to kind of celebrate him. But he was, he definitely kind of helped the Northwest Indiana reach like a wide national audience because the movie was kind of a flop when it first came out, but it ended up being embraced because it was on all the cable stations running 24 seven. And it's very well suited for that type of thing during the holidays because it's very episodic. It's basically just anecdotes of his childhood. And since it's the kind of thing that when you're cooking or entertaining, you can kind of dip in and out of, it doesn't, you know, the, his quest for a BB gun isn't really that strong of a <laughs> through <plot>. line. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, the plot is kind of uh, incidental. So it's, uh, it's very well suited to kind of like watching for a few minutes and then, you know, going on to do something else. Yeah. And uh, this was actually shot mostly in Cleveland, is that right? Oh, absolutely. And Cleveland actually has kind of capitalized almost more um, on uh, A Christmas Story as a tourist attraction than uh, Northwest Indiana, because they, they have the Christmas Story house where the movie was filmed. And then um, if you read some of the guidebooks to Cleveland, like that'll be the first thing they'll recommend. The department store in the movie is Higby's that Shepard wrote about, and it was filmed in downtown Cleveland, but it was based on the Goldblatt's that had a long time been a destination in uh, downtown Hammond. And you can still find the clock. They have a very ornate um, clock that's hanging in the downtown Hammond library, which is one of the last vestiges, sadly, because downtown Hammond used to be the major shopping district for the area. It was a uh, Downtown Gary and downtown Hammond were often compared to like many straight streets where they drew yeah. people not from the Illinois South suburbs as well as from throughout the region. They had grand movie pauses and grand, um, you know, streetcars bringing in, trawling in tons of people. But, you know, as suburbanization kind of encroached, those days have unfortunately faded. And well, so, and there used to be uh, trolleys you could take all the, from downtown Chicago to Northwest Indiana. Is that right? It was more kind of local. Was it trains? It was, was it? more kind of local. When they did do the, um, we, have, we have had the South Shore Line for more than a century where you do have the interurban train where you can go from, you've been able to go from 
Chicago yeah. to for, for some time. But they, they did have, like the Roby, for instance, when they did do the racetrack and everything, they would literally send, um, they, would, they would bring people in from, uh, you know, by bus from Chicago. It was a, you know, it was a very popular uh, draw because of the di differences in state law. You've seen that a lot. Because uh, Calumet City, for instance, in Illinois was once uh, West Hammond, and it was known for being a, lo a very seedy kind of place with a lot of like vice and nightlife for, you know, mainly for yeah. the factory workers in Indiana. So you constantly had this, uh, being right on the state border with Indiana and Illinois, you constantly had uh, drawing, trying to draw across people. You still have that in Northwest Indiana today with the casinos along the lakefront and people come here for the cigarettes because the taxes are cheaper and for the gas as well. And you've still seen that to be something of a draw because of the differences in uh, state law. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's always been ironic. I, I've, I've worked with some of the tourism bureaus along the, the corridor here, and they, you know, uh, they, they mentioned that, you know, people drive through northwest Indiana in order to get to Michigan to go to vacation, uh, and, you know, they're not stopping here as much as they could, and, they, you know, they're always trying to do things to attract more uh, uh, tourists and, and more visitors. What, what kinds of things are going on here that people can come and do if they're, you know, if they're taking a drive in the summer or... Absolutely, that yeah. is a real issue because the beaches are definitely more pristine in Southwest Michigan. Um, you know, they, they do have that on us, but we do have many fine beaches here. The Indiana Dunes National Park has many great, uh, beyond just the beaches, there's all kinds of historical um, places to visit. There's like a maple syrup, uh, annual maple syrup tapping festival. You can see some of the pioneer um, homes. There's all kinds of great hiking. It's one of the most biodiverse places in the entire country. You can literally see pine trees next to cacti. Um, it's, uh, it's a very, it's constantly renewing itself because yeah. the sand is always like in motion. And it's I, I heard that it was, in terms of biodiversity, it was like second to Galapagos Islands or something like that. Do you, oh, are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's very, um, it's incredibly diverse because the, um, the, set, the, the, the plants will, the, a lot of the trees and plants will die as the sand moves, and then that will kind of uh, renews the rest of the, uh, it renews and supports that. And it also, because of its location at the southern shore in Lake Michigan, the National Park has an annual burning festival because we get um, something like one of the largest concentrations of uh, migratory birds pass through here on, um, or pass through here every you know, year on their way south. You also have the, um, uh, you, you know, you can see great uh, blue herons. There's also the sandhill cranes that stop in the Jasper Pulaski Wildlife Area on their way before they winter down in uh, Georgia and Florida. And it's one of the best places to view that outside of Nebraska. That draws a lot of people. Um, but the region has many attractions from like award-winning craft breweries to a number of wineries to uh, the Chesterton European market. Um, and, and some outstanding restaurants too. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. You've had, uh, in Hammond, like the Jack Binion's uh, Steakhouse has been Zagat rated. You've had uh, the, unfortunately it's temporarily closed, but the Three Floyds Brew Pub was nominated repeatedly for James Beard Awards. You've had some like fairly, you've had some fairly prestigious, uh, you know, chefs working here. They bring in a lot of chefs from Chicago too. Uh, a lot of chefs from Chicago end up like either opening restaurants here closer to home or working for like local breweries, for instance, like 18th Street in downtown yeah. Hammond. So um, what's your favorite thing to do in Northwest Indiana? What, what kinds of things oh, do you do? I enjoy, I enjoy walking. I enjoy a lot of the nature. Um, hiking um, along the lakeshore and uh, some of the dunes are definitely among my, my favorite things. But there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of great art galleries and museums that go underappreciated. You have a lot of like uh, unique attractions like the Laporte, County History Museum, they've got uh, great exhibits to like uh, the Bell Guinness, the famous serial killer. You've got the Valparaiso University Art Museum is excellent, the Lubeznik Center of the Arts in Michigan City. Um, I, I like to get out um, a lot of nature and a lot of uh, Wolf Lake and Hammond has, has some excellent hiking. You can literally cross the state, what you can stand with one foot in Chicago and the other in Indiana. Um, the, the, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of great nature to see and then just, uh, there's a lot of, um, hidden kind of cultural gems. And uh, what, what are some of the cultural gems? The, um, I, would re or the culture, I would recommend, um, there's a lot of galleries, like particularly in Michigan City and Gary's like uh, Miller neighborhood. It's kind of a very bohemian like enclave. You can go gallery hopping like on a first Friday um, in either of those places. In there Michigan are, City, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, they have a wonderful arts district there where they have like a arts colony that they've uh, built downtown. 
Um, there's uh, just uh, there's a uh, uh, th there's just a wealth to do that I kind of go over in the books. There's also like a lot of unique culinary traditions like lake perch and frog legs, lemon rice soup, um, punch ghee, uh, pierogi. There's the big pierogi fest is one of the top draws to the area. It brings 300. Yeah. 50,000 people to downtown Whiting every year. It's and they, kind of they very still have quirky. the Greek food festival in Merrillville? Oh, absolutely, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of uh, ethnic food festivals are another big draw. You have a lot of Greek fests and Serb fests. You have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of ethnic churches here. Um, the president of Serbia was like one of two places he visited when he came to America because the Serbian population is so like uh, concentrated here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of, uh, from Savafi to a lot of the old world customs are very well maintained. Okay, very good. Well, that's all the time we have for our program. I want to thank uh, Joseph Pete for joining me here today on the Roundtable Perspective. I'm Tom Roach. I'll see you next time.